Good morning, church family. Please do have a seat. Okay. It's good to see you. Um, I always, uh, so as you know, I work at St. George's and I always smile because every time we do an outing, it turns cold. So this week, the grade sevens are out hiking. The last cold snap, the grade tens were out on an outing. The one before that, when it was snowing, Helmering Housing, I was out on an outing. So if you ever need just cold weather, let me know and I'll organize the outing. Okay, so just let me know. So, but it's, it's so good to see you this morning. Um, we are going to continue uh, talking about living out our discipleship. If you recall, <clears throat> excuse me, last time uh, before that, we spoke about the cost of discipleship and just incredible series. And, and now we're talking about how do you live out that discipleship? So do you remember WWJD? Man, that was a craze. Hey, remember the bracelets? And you were really committed if you had the bracelet, and when you took it off, there was a tan, okay? Because that means you wore it all the time. You were committed, okay? But it, it was a fun craze. It was when I was in my teenage years, and uh, it was everything was WWJT. And if you didn't know what it was, oh, you needed to go spend some time with the Lord. Um, but but there's, there's a lot of truth to this. Uh, it's a... Um, I think we cannot go wrong if we go throughout our life asking us, asking ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation? And so that's what we're going to be doing today, is we're going to be looking at what would Jesus want us to do in terms of living out small groups, okay? So uh, as you know, I'm a teacher as well, and I work with the youth, and so come December, my little introverted battery is in like negative 2,432. Exactly. And, um, and so what happens, my favorite thing to do in December, um, my mom lives with me now, see, I have to highlight, lives with me, not me with her, you see the difference, okay? Um, so my mom's, but what I used to love doing was to go to Etosha for four or five days on my own. And it was always so fun because I drive there and you know the ladies at the gate and all of that, that kind of look and they go, oh, you alone? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Where's your husband? I'm like, no, I'm just me alone just going to be here. You know, they, they couldn't, they, they always thought that this wasn't quite right, that I was there on my own for so many days, because then you also fill in how many days you're going to be there for, you know, and I'd write four days. They go, sure, it's a long time, no? And I'm like, mm-hmm, that's the aim, all right? That's the aim. <laughs> then I'd get to the reception and I'd have to pay, and same conversation. But for four days, I would not say a word other than thank you and please, you know, as you buy stuff. And other than that, I would speak to no one. And about a fellow introvert right here, okay? About day five, I was ready to have a conversation. And then I was ready to enter back into society and be a functioning member of society. So um, as much as I love my alone time, that's not how God created us. God created us to live in fellowship. And so we, we live in a world that we are more connected than ever before. But, but our connection is not one-on-one. -on -one. Have you ever typed this as a reply to someone and you're like, you're like, I'm laughing, rolling on the floor laughing. This is what it means, rolling on the floor laughing and you're like, that's so funny. All right, have you ever done that? Okay, and, and, and so this, this, is, this is where we, we are more connected, we are sending out this message, but it's not actually what's happening here. And so we live in a world where there's now, let me, let me know if I've missed one. WhatsApp, SMS, phone calls, Facebook, Messenger, emails, Telegram, WhatsApp calls, Instagram. What have I missed? Signal, TikTok, okay. No, no, that's one-on-one. -on -one. We don't want to. <laughs> Snapchat, okay. And so I look at all of this and I go, we are so connected, but basically it's more opportunities to offend each other. Have you ever noticed? Um, there is a reason why I have, you know that on WhatsApp, last scene, mine doesn't work, okay? You don't know when I was on last because it's just one more area to offend someone if you don't reply immediately. And so we live in a world that we are more connected but more disconnected than ever before. I was reading um, News 24 and, and uh, they had an article last night that really scared me. It said, children are more connected, are more addicted to pornography than ever before at a younger age than ever before. And that scares the living daylights out of me. And I think a lot of that we, we're not going to discuss, you know, COVID, but, but a lot of that came from that time where people had to isolate and, and be in their homes. And so you have, you have children that are so connected, but they don't know how to socialize anymore. It was the most interesting thing that when school started and we started events, people didn't know how to talk to each other anymore. You know, do I stand this far? Do I high five? Do I, you know, what do we do? And so that is where we are 
right now. We are more connected digitally than ever before, and I love, I love technology, guys, don't get me wrong, okay? But that is where we are, but where does God want us to be? And that's what we're gonna be looking at this morning. In Genesis chapter two, verse 18, uh, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good to the man, uh, for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Was this before or after the fall? Before. So when everything was perfect, and I know this is normally speaking about marriage, but this is also about connection because we're not all married, okay? So bef- while everything was perfect, God said that it is not good for man to be alone. And so if you have a look at God, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that is his, we are made in his image. And his image is community, together. So does living life together mean that we always agree? Not a chance, okay? You know the Proverbs, I love quoting this Proverbs when I disagree with someone. I'm like, you know, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You know that verse? Have you ever sharpened knives? Have you done that recently? It's not a pleasant experience. You go, <laughs> have you done that? Okay, I was going to do it here, but I didn't want to you know, grate my own ears this morning. And so iron sharpening iron is not fun. But you know what's worse than iron sharpening iron is a dull knife. Speak to any person that works in a kitchen, like a chef, and they say the only thing more dangerous than a sharp knife is a dull knife. Because what happens? You put more force on it, and that's when people get hurt. And so... When we have a look, sometimes living life together grates and it's painful, but that's how God wants it to be. You know that verse that says in Philippians that we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Does that verse mean that we must earn our salvation? No, 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 it's we have our salvation and now we're walking it out. We, we have the salvation and now we're figuring out what that means and we're growing closer to the Lord every day. Romans 12, renewing your mind, casting off the old, putting on the new. And that happens in community. Don't know if you can see this so clearly, it's a lot of white, but can you see what that is? It's a pearl. Ladies, anybody? Okay, all right. So <laughs> that's a pearl and a pearl is of great value. How is a pearl made? Does anybody know? It starts with an irritation. Okay? Starts with an irritation. So what happens is a piece of sand or something will come into that pearl and it's irritated. And so it starts putting a layer upon layer upon layer until you have this beautiful pearl that has great value. And so I think that's a great picture of how God wants us to live life. Being, living life together. I can guarantee you in this room, not everybody agrees on everything. I mean, we can bring five people together and they'll have different viewpoints. But can we agree that Jesus Christ is Lord? Yes. And can we move forward from there? Because when we live life together, it's iron sharpens iron. And it takes those irritations to bring great priceless things out. If you ever look at the the, the disciples, who were the disciples? We have a whole bunch of them, but they were fishermen. So I grew up around fishermen. My stepdad was a big fisherman. Fishermen, and I apologize if you're a fisherman out here, okay, they, um, when they're out fishing, they're not the most cultured. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, my, my stepdad would always freak me out. He did this, this um, research thing, and, and fish have this ear, right? Uh, but I don't know, even. But he would cut it out and go, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. So fishermen, you know, the the worst for me is when I would go fishing and I'd come back and I'd smell the pilchards. Can you smell it? It's great. Not. Okay. So pilchards, and, and, and that was part of fishing. But the disciples, they were fishermen. There was a tax collector. Okay. A tax collector uh, was the worst form of Jew you could get. He was part of the disciples. You have a zealot who was uh, probably like a politician or a revolutionary. And Jesus brought all of these people together as a group, and for three years, walked through life. So when you look at those three years, was it always pretty? Was it always good? Did they always agree? No, they are arguing, who's going to be the greatest? And then they, were, you know, they would get things so wrong. And, and yet, we have a look, we know, we know Peter. Peter was a very brash guy. You know, Peter was a guy that knew everything. Do you have those people in your life? Okay. Then you have John, the smug little you know, guy that would go, the disciple who Jesus loved. 
He always refers to himself like that. Then Jesus lay against the chest of the disciple whom he loved. He's speaking about himself, okay? You have him, and then you have Thomas who says, I won't believe until I see it, you know? And yet God brings all those people together and uses those 12 people to change the whole world. So when we look at us as a church family, God brings different people from different cultures, different experiences, and brings something unique, a unique harmony. Bet you've never seen this in church before. So this is a South African guy. His name is The Kifness, all right? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and what he does is he takes little clips and he makes something awesome. So we're going to quickly play this, all right? Haku, sing. Haku, sing. had to show you that. <laughs> I'll play it afterwards, okay? So you see how he takes one thing, all right, and then he adds, and all of a sudden you have this beautiful song. Well, beautiful, yeah, relative, but I think it's very cool, okay? And he brings it all together, and you have this unique harmony. And to me, as much, I mean, I just love listening, but I look at that, and I see that's the church. People coming together from different backgrounds, and the thing that makes, out, makes us have this unique harmony is Jesus. So let's have a look in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. This is now after Jesus has ascended, and Peter is speaking and says, and he does this whole thing about who God is, who Jesus is. And it says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved." Incredible passage. And that shows the beginning of the church as we know it. So let's have a look. Number one, do you remember Peter, the guy that ran away when, when uh, somebody said, aren't you the one that was with Jesus? And it says was like, a, like a, a cleaning lady or something like that, right? And he runs away. That same person is the one that stands up and speaks about who God is. And 3,000 are added to him that day, to the to following. And that's incredible because that's the power of being in a group. That's the power of living life together and with Jesus. Secondly, people came to know the Lord. Okay? That to me is incredible. And then in verse 44, it says, And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. One of the things that's happened with COVID is that a lot of people haven't come back to church. Different uh, researches have been done, and they say it's about between 10 and 20 percent at least of people that were attending church have not come back after church. And so, when we have a look at this, we need to understand that meeting together is part of what God asks us to do. I'm sorry, I was just, um, here's this verse. In Hebrews verse 10 24, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so we see that that is part of God's plan, is that we do this. We come together as a church family. We celebrate who God is together. Let's have a look at verse 46. They worshiped together at the temple each day, and then they met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. So we see two things. 
One, they met together, and then they broke into smaller groups. This is Hillsong. That's a lot of people, okay? Do you think this person over here knows that person over there? Chances are, <laughs> but I want to ask you this morning, do the people on this side know the people on that side? <laughs> look around, look around. Are there people here today that you don't know? So, so we, are, we are in the very privileged position as staff members to know most of the church family. And I will be surprised over and over again. I go, have you met so-and-so? And, -so? and they'll go, no. And I'm like, do you know? No, but we've been together in the same church for three years. And I'm, guys, this is not a very big hall. <laughs> okay? This is not, not Hillsong. And so there is something, even in a small group like this, we don't know each other that well yet. That's why we're having the fun day. What a great way to get to know each other than over meat. Does say, all right? Does say. But even in a, in a smaller group like this, deep connection happens in smaller groups. John Ortberg, <clears throat> excuse me, says, God uses people to form people. That is why what happens between you and another person is never merely human-to-human -human interaction. The spirit longs to be powerfully at work in every encounter. So when we have a look at that passage in Acts, we have meeting together and we have meeting in homes. It's not either or, it's both. And so what happens when we meet in small groups? So there are, there are so many different names. It's small groups, Bible study groups, cell groups, life groups, get together, whatever you want to call it. What happens in those? Well, scripturally, it's a time of coming together, praying together, spending time studying God's word, encouraging each other, figuring out how to make the, the hearing of the message from Sunday into a practical walking of the message. So one of the things I love about this church is we have conversations during the message. Have you noticed that? Yeah. We will, and and um, when John Hunter was here, it happened a lot more. You know, we'd have this conversation with, you know, while somebody's speaking. But there is a practicality of I'm standing here, I present a message, and then we need to figure out how does that apply to my life? And that's what takes place in small groups. The very first Bible study I joined, God reminded me of this story this morning, actually. It was very funny. Uh, I became a believer when I was 16, and um, I was supposed to go join my first Bible study at night. And uh, that afternoon, uh, it was my mom and just my sister and I were living together, and a friend and I had to trim the palm trees, okay? And it was a huge palm tree. And we're like, yeah, we can do this, hey? We can do this. And so off we went, we climbed, and we started trimming the palm tree. And you know when you, when you bring down a, a branch, I learned a very important lesson. Don't bring it down close to your knee, uh, close to your leg, okay? Because if you bring it down close to your leg, you know those little sharp things that go into your leg, okay? And so uh, I was supposed to have time to go get ready, but I had this whole like, thing in my leg, and so I had to go to someone who <laughs> used pliers to try and get it out of my leg. But all of that was that by the time it was Bible study time, I was a slightly bloody mess with, you know, blood here and my hair was full of stuff. And that's how I went to my first Bible study. You know, it's like, hi, guys. <laughs> that's how I went to my first Bible study. And I remember sitting there and I'm going, yeah, yeah. And then this was the first question I asked. I was like, so I hear like the Holy Spirit is like the love between God, the Father and the Son. And they were very sweet. They said, no. It's not quite how it works. But that was my first question. That was my first engagement in Bible studies. And I thought it was so awesome because there was a very dirty mess asking a question that was so not right. And I felt very loved and very cared for because they answered my question. And from there, that was the beginning of my walk. And that was being in small groups. So have you ever seen this thing? Ziggy, you're not allowed to answer. Um, so we like to call it the Johari window, but it's named after a guy named, I think, Johann, uh, John and Harry. So it's the Johari window, okay? So the concept is there are things that are known to ourselves and things that are not known to, our, uh, to others. Um, does that make sense? Do I have to explain the whole thing? So bottom line, bottom line, okay? There are areas in our life that we know about ourselves and that others know about, okay? Then there are areas that we know about, the hidden area or facade, but that other people don't know about, okay? Then we have areas that others know about, but we don't know about. That's a special area. And then you have that other area about 
not known to others and not known to ourselves, and that's things that God will still bring out. So that blind spot area, that blind spot area comes out very well when you're in small groups or when you do life together. So um, God has taken me on quite a journey over the years, a lot of healing, um, a lot of working through things. And when I first started uh, here in Vintook and that new song, back when it was still called Brian's Church, uh, okay, because we didn't have a name for the church then. Um, I had a lot of people pleasing in my life and um, I did a lot of manipulation of trying to figure out, okay, how can I, you know, make sure that you owe me, but I never owe you kind of thing. And after a lot of work, Dan is already smiling. And after a lot of work, I started becoming healthier emotionally. And then Dana said to me, Dana, why don't you just say what you said to me one day? Because apparently when you're healthy, you don't try to please people, so people will try and manipulate you, and you just go, no. <laughs> but those were one of the things that I, I realized, okay, maybe I need to be a little bit nicer, okay? But those are the things that, that when you're in a group, this comes out. Have any of you ever discovered something that everybody else knew about you, but you didn't? It's not a, necessarily a very fun process, okay? But it's a process that God uses so, so, so much. And so when we have a look at... at Sorry, something's funny. When we have a look at small groups, that's what happens in small groups. It's living life together, discovering more of Jesus, but also discovering more of yourself. I'm not, I'm going to give an illustration. I think I saw, anyway. So on Friday, we had, um, we had YWAP, and one of our YWAPers brought a friend with that um, didn't, didn't know Jesus, right? And um, afterwards, I said, hey, but you weren't spending that, because they were a bunch of friends. And I said, you weren't spending that much time with them. And she said, you know, I think we can be a little bit overwhelming. And I'm like, us? Really? <laughs> <laughs> and then she goes, I'm just so glad we didn't have anybody's birthday today. Because apparently when we sing happy birthday, what to us is angelic voices isn't apparently angelic to everybody else, right? And I thought that was, I love that, because I thought, that's what small groups do. Small groups is a place to bring those that don't know Jesus yet. Have you ever, when, before you were a believer, were you invited to church? And he's like, come join me at church. And you're like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm -mm, okay. But when you go, hey, we're meeting with a bunch of friends. We're going to talk some stuff. Do you want to come and join us? It's a whole different situation. I remember Dana started her first Bible study, or the Tuesday Bible study, right, uh, as a way to, to introduce somebody to who Jesus is. And so that's also what happens in small groups. It's an incredible way that you can bring non-believers in and show them who Jesus wants to be. When we look at scripture, scripture speaks, see, believers, groups, I love, guys, can I just tell you now, <laughs> one of the things I love about this church, and that is why we very specifically named this new song Family Church, is because we are a family. And I love it when we have little ones coming up so she's going to do the next part of the sermon, and then, and then we'll do the closing together. So I just want to tell you, if you have children, you need to know that in this church, any sound of children is welcome. We have... Are you going to cry if I pick you up? Because that will not be good for my image. <laughs> okay. No, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> We used to have a, um, it's an international hockey player. She's a brilliant, brilliant hockey player. But we knew her when she was smaller. And she would be in church with her little barbie heels going clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. And so during prayer time, she'd clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop to Dana and go, I want some gum. Dana would give her some gum. Clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, all the way back. And that's how we started this church. So you need to know, I feel like I'm getting a lot of attention here. <laughs> I feel, you, you know when Jesus taught and the, the children were right there? I'm getting that vibe right now. <laughs> She's listening. It's awesome. So you need to know that this is New Song Family Church. And we, we very strongly love children and firmly believe that this is a place, as a church family, where children need to feel loved and welcomed and, and just adored. Okay. Side note. Right. So... Scripture speaks very strongly about how we are, as believers, supposed to treat each other. And what's, if you have a look, it's interesting, the Ten Commandments, how do they start? <laughs> okay, give me a commandment. <laughs> okay. okay, do not murder, do not steal, right? 
Okay, later on, you've got a lot of do nots. Okay, and so we have the Old Testament with a lot of do nots. And then what does Jesus say when, when he's asked, uh, what, what is the most important commandment? What does Jesus say? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. So do you see how we move from the do nots to the do's? Okay, we as a church family, we need to be known for what we are for rather than for what we are against. Does that make sense? And so when I look at, at how, how God uh, brings people together, you have a look in scripture, and the word one another appears like something like 150 times. Okay? And so one another is in Greek is two words. I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. <laughs> Number one. Okay? But when you have a look at those verses, a few themes show up. All right. So 100 times it's used in the New Testament. 47 of those verses give instructions to followers of Jesus, and Paul wrote about 60% of those one another commands, right? And one of the themes is unity in the church. One third of the one another commands deals with unity in the church. Be at peace with one another. Don't grumble among one another, except one another. That's a lot of one another's. Then you have a look at the next one. Another third instruct Christians how to love one another. Tolerate one another in love. The next 15% is about humility and how we behave with each other. And this can go on and on and on. And you keep looking at the rest of the verses. Um, and what is funny as I was reading this, there's also the greet one another in a holy kiss. But they said, look at the cultural context before you greet your pastor with a kiss. I'm like, good plan, good plan, good plan. Okay. But when you have a look at scripture, you see the one another is such an important theme. And so that to me points to another reason why we should be meeting as a church family, but then also meeting in smaller groups. We are created to, to walk life together. And yes, we have our family groups and that, but we also need to learn from each other. This is now the practical part. So I would like us to do a little survey, okay? And Atida and and, and, and the rest of the, the group will be handing out a little paper with a pencil. Did you hear the story about, um, what was it? Uh, one country spent like millions to see how a pen could work in space because of gravity and everything. The other country just used the pencil, okay? So we are using a pencil this morning, okay? And so it's just a, a, a paper and a pencil. And so I would like just to find out from us as a church family, would you, if you are not currently, would you like to be attending a small group? Would you be willing to host a small group? Would you be willing to lead or to facilitate a small group? I hope this morning you see the value of meeting in small groups. That as we look in scripture, we see it over and over again. But this, we need to now make it practical. You don't have to be the same person hosting and leading, okay? <laughs> I do not have the guess, gift of, um, what, what is it, uh, hospitality with it being pretty, all right? I'm like, come on in, this is how it is. Other people, we have a friend that the only way you serve tea is in a teapot. Me, I take, me ne, I take the tea bag. <laughs> there we go, all right. So hosting, you don't have, it doesn't have to be the same person hosting and leading. We have seen that there's a lot of um, misunderstanding of what does it mean to actually lead a Bible study. And so one of the questions is, if you are willing to lead a Bible study, what kind of training would you like? Because leading doesn't mean you need to know everything. If that was the, the meaning of leading, none of us would be here. Okay? Leading means you're willing to listen to God's voice. You're willing to put yourself out there. And so I'm going to ask the band forward to come forward to, um, what did I say? Kaplunka, kaplunka. Yeah, do some background noise so it's not awkward silence. Okay. Um, if you don't want to put your name on, you're so welcome. You don't have to. This is just that if you do want to attend a Bible study, we can see how we can figure that out. And so we want to see how can we get this church to be a church that's meeting in small groups. We already have that happening a lot of times. There are different groups throughout the week. 
but we want to make sure that we are connecting. Yes, Sigi. Okay, if you are leading a small group, arise. <laughs> okay, and 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 here as well, we're also arising. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so so what we're going to do next after this, we're going to take this information and then compile information. So we'll have which Bible studies are meeting when, and for which groups, because some some are for couples, some are for individuals. And we're going to put that information out there. We're actually working on um, a website that people can sign up and contact and find out who the leaders are. So we will. The, the idea of this is that we take all this information, like you're saying, Ziggy, and then passing it on to the church family. But we need more. Did you see that only a few of us stood? We need more. Okay. Does everybody have a pencil? We're getting there. Okay. Guys, 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 you young. You need to move quicker. It's us old people. By the way, hello to everybody that's online. <laughs> if you would like to, oh, JP, is it this camera? Because that would be awkward if it's that one. Okay, all right. Uh, if you would like to lead or host or be part of a Bible study, just put it in the comments, uh, and then we'll pick it up afterwards. So we're just going to have a time of, of filling out the forms, but please feel free to, to partake in that. Thank you. <sighs> have you ever had to do something like that? It feels very weird to speak to a camera. All right, what do we need, guys? Do we need more pencils? Okay, can we get more people handing out pencils? Guys, you young, you must move. Okay, over here. Thank you, guys, you're awesome. You don't have to put your surname if you don't want to. Just write down what kind of training you'd like and we'll arrange. Oh. <laughs> I just got a message, you know, the beauty, you get messages on your phone uh, from Nico who's saying that they're watching from home and they have a small group meeting on Wednesdays. And uh, so I love, you see, I love technology, right? Technology is awesome if used for God's glory. So we will put that all together. They have a group that meets on Wednesdays, uh, young ladies from 6 to 8 p.m. in Pioneers Park. All right, so we're going to put all this information together. If you could keep the paper with you, and then as you leave, uh, Rania, just put your hand up. Do you mind collecting all the papers? Okay. So as you leave, Rania, the handsome young man at the back there, <laughs> yes, he's busy, you know, <laughs> and then he drops his pencil. He will collect the papers from you. Thanks, Rania. Okay. All right. Church family, we are very excited about where we're going to from here. We know that we need to meet together and meet in small groups. Let us uh, continue worshiping. Thank you.